I think the whole case the other side is putting really comes down to an emotional case rather than a rational one. William Lane Craig seemed to think that it would be so intolerable, so disagreeable that uh, we are doomed to death, that the universe is doomed to death. Somehow playing on the heartstrings, playing on the emotions, it's not nice to think that we're all going to die. It's not nice to think that the universe is going to die a heat death and uh, that everything is going to come to an end. It's not nice to think that everything is meaningless. And therefore, somehow, we, that must prove that there is purpose in the universe, that there is some sort of top-down supervising God. David Wolpe seemed to, I thought rather disagreeably, claim for the theist side a monopoly on such things as love and uh, the things that, again, touch the heartstrings. Do the people on that side really think that atheists don't love? Do they really think that we don't get a, a fantastic swelling of the, of, the, of the breast when we look up at the Milky Way, when we look down a microscope and see the amazing complexity of life? Do you think that we don't have emotions? Do you think we're somehow mechanical? The other side uses words like mere, accident, reductive, nothing but chemistry, nothing but blind forces. What our side is saying is that because of the amazing process of evolution by natural selection, we have brains that bring into the universe, maybe for the first time, that bring into the universe all these wonderful things like love and value and indeed purpose. We construct our own purposes. Do you seriously think that the people on our side don't have purposes? Do you think that we don't fall in love? Do you think that we don't, when we write our books, have a purpose in writing our books? Do you think that when we go through life, we lack all purpose simply because there is no top-down governor? We have purposes just the same as anybody else. But we have an explanation for why we have a brain that has a purpose. It's because of evolution by natural selection. Now, Mr. Craig was critical of me for refusing to answer the why question because I said it's a silly question. The mere fact that you can ask a question in the English language doesn't make it a question that deserves an answer. I could say, what is the color of jealousy? It's not a sensible question. It's a silly question. And the same goes for the question of why is the universe the way it is. Welcome, please, to the ring. Un applauso al professor Michu Kaku. Well, after such, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> On one side, we have my esteemed colleagues who are 100% certain that the universe is pointless, meaningless, and there is no God. On the other side, we have another group that is 100% certain the universe has a point, has a meaning, and there is a God. One side's right, one side's wrong, right? My personal point of view is they're both wrong. What is science? Science is based on decidable statements. If I drop my cell phone, I know it's decidable that it will fall under gravity. Science is based on statements that you can test, reproducible, decidable, falsifiable. But the question of does God exist, does the universe have a point, is undecidable. It is not part of science. It's like trying to disprove a unicorn. Let's say you want to disprove the existence of unicorns. 
it's really hard to do because maybe some island maybe in outer space there are unicorns how do you prove that unicorns do not exist very difficult now I'm a physicist my goal in life is to complete Einstein's dream of an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that will summarize all physical knowledge and allow us to quote read the mind of God so what was his point of view toward God Einstein said there really are two types of God and that's the source of confusion the first God is the personal God the God of vengeance the God that smites the Philistines the God that answers your prayers the God of Moses and Isaac and Jacob Einstein said he couldn't believe in that God but there's a second God the God of Spinoza Leibniz the God of harmony beauty simplicity elegance that the universe could not have been an accident so I see no evidence of God however that doesn't mean that there is no existence uh, there's no meaning that doesn't mean there's not a purpose or a God out there I just can't see it in the equations of physics so in string theory which is what I do for a living we think we have a candidate for the theory of everything the theory that eluded Einstein and so we even now have a candidate for the mind of God in string theory because everything is based on vibrating strings Time out. The candidate for the mind of God would be. Oh, time's up. Meet you, God. Just. Ju, ju, the last candidate word, please. for the mind of God would be cosmic music Thank you. resonating through 11 dimensional hyperspace. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michu Kaku. Well, I have to say that I'm surprised by what Michio Kaku said at the very beginning in ascribing to our team hundred percent certainty in what we have argued. I don't think any of us claimed to have a hundred percent certainty and in fact I would say that all of the arguments we presented for the existence of God were probability arguments and they are arguments to the effect that the existence of God is so likely that it is the way we ought to bet with our lives if we should have purpose. That is not one hundred percent certainty. But I did get the sense of 100% certainty that science is the, the only source of knowledge according to this side over here and Michio Kaku, maybe that's your view too, I don't know because you did say that the God question is undecidable. How undecidable? Well, presumably because you can't prove that God exists or even show his probability if you have science only to go with. But of course there are many things we know including that God may well exist because of other evidence without depending exclusively on science. Richard Dawkins uh, has accused us of making an emotional argument but I believe that his presentation is especially emotional. He has not argued that God does not exist. Thank you. He has not shown that any of the arguments we, pre we presented here today are fallacious. Rather, he has simply dismissed the idea of God as pathetic. Time out, I'm sorry. That's emotional. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. Wow. Michu Kaku, please. In my next book, Physics of the Future, I try to predict the next 100 years based on interviews with 300 scientists. Very difficult question. But I predict, I predict that a hundred years from now, on the 103rd anniversary of this conference, we will have another debate arguing the same thing over again. Because, for two reasons. First, it is undecidable. You cannot decide this question using any known rational means. It is undecidable. Second, there's probably also a God gene. 
Some people believe that perhaps we are genetically predisposed to believing in higher beings. In which case, we'll be talking about this debate forever, as long as we have our genes. Now, my colleague Stephen Hawking recently wrote a very controversial statement, was in all the headlines. He said, first, we have a theory of everything. It's string theory, the theory that I work on, and it takes you before the Big Bang. Therefore, God is not necessary because we now have a theory of the pre-Big Bang universe. My attitude is, well, where did string theory come from? It goes on forever. Even if you Time. can go before the Big Bang, then the question is, where did that theory come from? Time Undecidable. Out. Thank you. Four things I did not say. One, I never said scientists don't have poetry and love and so on. I said they're not susceptible to the scientific method. That's very different. Second, I did not say that my opponents were pathetically lazy. Third, I did not say they were childish. And that's why, fourth, I did not say that good manners in argument are only on our side and not on their side. But here's one thing that I did say. I've sat at the bedside of scores of people who are dying. I've held their hands. I have faced death several times myself through illness. I know what it is to understand that you are ending your life in this world. And I know what it is to ask yourself the question, is this the only world or is the universe something greater and something deeper? We don't claim we can prove God. We don't claim we can prove purpose. We do claim that our intuition of purpose is not empty, it's not foolish, it's not childish, and it's not stupid. That when I hold the hand of someone who's dying, that I really do believe that I usher them into another mode of being. People have believed that since the beginning of time, and the fact that not everyone believes it today doesn't mean it is not true. After all, though he slay me, still will I believe in him. Thank you. When you hold the hand of somebody who's dying, it's nice for them to think that they're going to a better place. Of course it's comforting. That doesn't make it true. You cannot argue for some truth about the universe <laughs> by saying that it would be nice if, if it were true. Of course there is mystery. There is enormous mystery in the universe and that's what science is working on. To respond to that mystery by saying God did it, to respond to that mystery by saying oh, there's just some divine designer who figured it all out. That is lazy. It doesn't answer the question. Darwin provided us with the role model for how you approach that kind of thing. He took the really hard case, which is life. He took the case where it seemed obvious to everybody that it had to have a purpose, that it had to be designed. He showed for the hard case that it could be done. That's what science is working on. The mystery, when it is solved, will be solved by scientists who will use the Darwinian method, that's to say, they will explain in a bottom-up way how it is, not just that life came about, and we know that, we understand that now, but also how it is that the universe came about. That is the challenge of science. That is what science is going to rise to. We shall not resort to lazy, second-rate explanations that just lie down under the problem and say, God did it. Time out. Wow. Un aplauso, un gran aplauso para los seis, para los seis metros. Please, if you could stand up, un aplauso de todos para ustedes. Matt, eh, Michael, or Richard, whoever you want. Okay, so first of all, we're not saying that we're, uh, the universe has, uh, that we have no purpose. We are the purpose givers. We are the, the humble ones in, in that sense. So 
And it comes from the fact that this is what, what we do. We look for love, career work, meaningful work, helping other people, and transcendence. That's where it comes from. We are the purpose makers. And here's, I'll leave you with a, a purpose you can have. Always seek purpose with somebody else's purpose in mind, and never seek purpose in trying to take somebody else's purpose away. It's a very simple principle. Okay. Please, Douglas. Well, first of all, I simply want to thank our moderator and the entire conference organizers team uh, for including a handful of theists in the program for this conference. I'm serious about that, and I hope that that will continue. I think it's a very worthwhile discussion we've had. Let me finish thank you, with a quote by C.S. Lewis, a great Christian thinker, who said, If I find in myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy, then probably I was made for another world. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Dawkins, the last remark. Simplicity is that which is easy to understand. Complexity is that which is difficult. We as scientists are engaged on an enterprise to understand complexity, and that's the difficult problem. Purpose is one of the manifestations of complexity. Purpose comes from brains. Brains come late in the universe. Brains and purpose and all the other things like love are things that require explanation and we are working on explaining them. That's not arrogant, that's hard work, that's diligence, that's going for Time it. out, I'm sorry. Gracias. Michukaku. Michael Shermer, Richard Dawkins, Matt Ridley, please, William Lane Craig, David Walker, Douglas Teufel. Un aplauso para todos ellos. Sam. Para todos ustedes. Esto lo podrán ver en YouTube, en la página de la Ciudad de las Ideas, en Proyecto 40, en Cinépolis, un fuerte aplauso para todos ellos.